Hello, everyone, and welcome to the seventh event of the Safe Heavens Freedom Talk series. This time in collaboration with Shutushor. My name is Mertem Öztürk, and I'm a communications officer at Safe Heavens and Freedom Talks. Today, I'm very happy to introduce Ahmedur Shovdury, also known as Tutul, and Lisa Irene Knight. Tutul is the publisher, editor, and co-director of Shoot to Shore, and Lisa is the editor and co-director of Shoot to Shore since 2018. In today's talk, they will have a conversation on Shoot to Shore's story and some challenges faced by exiled artists. And I will leave the word to Lisa after we see the video of the editors of Shoot to Shore. Hello, my name is Ektisad, and it is a great honor for me to be a member of Shutashur's editorial board. Shutashur and its founder, Ahmed Rosh Chaudhary, or Tutulhai as he's lovingly known to us, are inseparable. Tutulhai is one of those rare individuals who believes truly and firmly in the power of words. It is even more remarkable in today's world, where the cynic would suggest that words have next to no power, um, as lies and oppression um, have free reign. That has only made the fire burn even more fiercely within Tutupai. He, and by extension his baby, Shutashur, um, waged a two and a half decade long war between free thinking and fundamentalism for the very soul of Bangladesh. Uh, they were the protagonists and they paid a heavy price for that. Um, fundamentalists wish to assassinate Tutupai and when the machetes fell on him, that ended Shutashur as a publisher. Not to be deterred, this man who, whose idealism is a true inspiration you only need to spend um, a, a minute in his presence to be overwhelmed by this man who, who, who remains optimistic and idealistic, who remains committed to free speech and free thinking, even though they nearly cost his life. Um, and by remaining committed <laughs> against all odds, against all sense, um, he has taken that vision, that battle of his, uh, from being that of one for the soul of Bangladesh to a global commitment to free thinking, to progressivism, to allowing marginalized, vulnerable, and oppressed people to speak and be heard. Hello, uh, my name is Ibtisam Ahmed. I am one of the contributing editors at Shuntashur. Um, I first got involved with Shuntashur as a regular contributor for some of the magazine issues. Um, the ethos of uplifting marginalized voices really spoke to me as a queer Bangladeshi. Um, I come from a country where my sexuality continues to be a criminal offence. And knowing the truth of short as a printing press, uh, and then later on as an online magazine, continue to support a community and continues to support a community that is at risk, despite the risk that that then brings to should the short itself, um, really touched me. Uh, and I was so fortunate to contribute to some pieces. Um, I wrote for a few different issues and then I was fortunate enough to be asked to come on board as a, a full-time contributing editor and it is um, a decision I'm so glad I made when I said yes. 
um, it was very full. It was a wonderful full circle moment when I got to help with the LGBTQ plus special issue. Uh, so going from someone who couldn't openly talk about my sexuality to then helping in my own small way, um, shaping a special issue on queer rights was amazing. And uh, should the show continue to do that, it continues to be a space of empowerment for marginalized communities and for marginalized voices. And for that reason, I am eternally grateful um, to Doodle Pay and to the rest of my Should the Show colleagues. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share this experience. And I hope um, inspire others to support Should the Show and platforms like it, because we need more spaces like it. We need more protections. We need more freedoms. And this is the best way to do it. So thank you very much. I got involved with Should the Show by happenstance. Iqtisad Ahmed, a mutual writer friend of ours, introduced me to Ahmed Rashid Chuchul, who is looking for people to write for the show. Now I realize that as an exile writer, I was always meant to be a British for the show, a magazine run by an exile editor and publisher. Being a British for the show means a lot to me. In a new country, in a new society, exile writers have to rediscover themselves. They have to motivate themselves to renew their sense of purpose, to continue with their intellectual endeavor. I'm thankful that should the show exists, for it provides a platform for people like us, considered pariahs by their own countries, for it offers a virtual sanctuary to continue with our intellectual struggle. Readers who are interested in reading stories that remain unread and unheard in the cacophony generated by social media platforms will find should they share publishing stories that address the human condition, often from the perspective of those marginalized. This is what makes Should they share unique and special. He brought us on board to assist him, not that he needs any assistance, um, but to participate, I suppose, in, in this journey of his. Um, we hope to remain uh, with him, uh, knowing full well that as long as we are guided by his principles and his vision, um, we and Shutasho will remain a force for good in a world that desperately needs it. We welcome all of you to share in our journey to um, participate by by reading us, by writing to and for us, um, by sharing with us um, not only the struggles that the world uh, is up against, but the beauty to be found within those, um, the pockets of progressivism and resistance that are springing up wherever the might of, might of oppression um, seems to devastate communities and societies. Thanks to the Freedom Talk team and Safe Muse. Frederick, Meltem, and Jan for inviting Shuddha Show to speak about our journey. Listening to our editorial board, I'm emotionally moved and inspired. I am very grateful for the efforts and great ideas from Iktishad Ahmed, Iktisham Ahmed, and Shiddhar Tathar. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us um, today. Um, and I also want to thank the Freedom Talk team and Safe News um, for this opportunity. So Tutul, I wanna start with asking you a question. Um, this journey of yours, um, this journey of Shudha Shore has been a long and winding road. 
you didn't expect to be here or where you are now in Norway, working on an online Shoot the Shore platform to what has now become a wide and diverse international audience. So tell us something about how you started this journey. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, my childhood was not very colorful. I grew up mostly alone, which was unusual in Bangladesh. Today, things are different. Uh, there's a different type of being alone today. When I look at my own children and their mobile-centric lonely lives, I cannot uh, no longer think of my childhood as lonely. So whatever the reason, maybe it was due to a lack of opportunity to keep busy, or I just got addicted to reading the newspaper. I don't know. Each evening, newspapers used to come to our district town, and I would rush to look for the newspaper. So I think uh, that's how my acquaintance with politics, literature, and other writings began. These things were in the newspapers, and I found more opportunities to gain more knowledge. Mm. I love that image of you um, rushing after school to uh, compete with your father to get to the newspaper uh, first. Um, it's a real evocative kind of image. Uh, it's also around this time that you became acquainted with the little magazine movement. And this is really important for understanding Shoot the Shore, not just then, but also its current mission and practices today. So for those listeners who aren't familiar with Little Magazine, this is a term that refers to literary, literary periodicals that became especially popular in the early 1900s in cities like London, Paris, and some major US cities like Chicago and New York. In the 1950s, they, the Little Magazine also became popular in South Asia, where you had numerous Little Magazines popping up in different regional, regional languages. Little Magazines produced some very significant writers or people who became famous later, but the magazines themselves often didn't last very long because they were more focused on experimentation and political and social criticism than about commercial success. Yes, so it was through this uh, kind of open school or curiosity that I came to know about the little magazine. Uh, I was then in the 11th grade, just then the idea of Shuddha Shore came to my mind. I didn't know uh, how to publish a magazine. So without any experience, I planned the magazine. At the young age, I used to think of poetry as meditation, as love, philosophy, and everything. So let the first issue be the issue of poems. So however, the most difficult task was to collect ads. We needed ads, but after the magazine was, but after the magazine was published, most of the advertisement, uh, advertiser uh, would not pay the money. So eventually I sold my favorite camera to cover the cost of uh, printing. So this is the beginning of Shuddha Shur. Mm. So I want to return to this financial aspect again later, but first let's talk about the philosophy of Shuddha Shur uh, when you started the little magazine. Initially the philosophy was not very organized. We were very young, just finished our secondary school. We were attracted to the Little Magazine platform as a free independent platform. Through Little Magazine, we could practice political theory and debate outside the normal partisan politics. We were able to experiment with ideas and different forms of writing. So Little Magazine also clarified our position about discourse and analysis because we were not limited by mainstream commercial media. You know, Shuddha Shur's slogan says something important about our philosophy. Our slogan is to inspire, not to impress. So Little Magazine is never a commercially driven platform. So it is usually not a large platform at all. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, but none, nonetheless, uh, Shuddha Shur eventually did become um, 
uh, established, right? It became established as a publication house. Uh, and some of the photos that are will be shown shortly um, from the Shooter Shoot Source book launches and annual Ekushi Book Festival in Dhaka. These were very festive events, very exciting events that brought together many new established writers, women writers, LGBTQ um, writers, and lots of interested and curious readers. So Shuddha Shore did become you know, quite significant in, in Bangladesh as a publication house. So since, since exile, since restarting Shuddha Shore online, what has changed in that original philosophy? Uh, you know, Risa, Shuddha Shore is still being conducted based on these same concepts. First of all, we have been committed from the very beginning to promote new and young writers. We're excited to invite it to and encourage young writers with good, interesting ideas and give them a chance to develop their thinking. Yes, and I think that is so important. From, from my own personal experience and as a teacher, I find that writing is such an excellent process for thinking. Um, so when I start to write something, for example, usually my ideas are all, all, all over the place. Maybe I have you know, a couple of good ideas here and there, but they don't really make any sense together or make any significant contribution until I start um, working them into a piece of writing. And um, it's probably also because of this process. Uh, it's a, you know, can be a painful process. It's a, it's a challenging process. But I also really, really love working with students and our interns who write for Shudhishwar, um, just to see them develop as well. Yes, that's right. Also, as before, Shudhishwar is working to increase the scope of what I like to call the third eye, a clear human vision and thinking. People can acquire the ability to make good decisions if they can look at any issue multidimensionally and consider it from different perspectives. So we believe that such a multidimensional view of people, a sense of consideration will promote democratic, humanistic, and a fair and just society. So multidimensional thinking will motivate people to refrain from all kinds of conflicts. Mm. Um, that's a really interesting concept that um, multidimensional thinking and it makes me think about the themed issues that we publish, which are focused on a single topic, right? Like exile or racism or authoritarianism. And in each of these issues, um, we have something around 20 or so writers, students, academics, activists, you know, everyday people who focus on that one topic from their different perspectives. Uh, and it's it's not it's never that all perspectives are presented. That's that's not possible. And we've talked we've often talked about how some voices are missing in a particular issue, but we tried to highlight marginalized voices to encourage that multidimensional thinking that you're describing about a particular subject. <clears throat> so, um, but before we dig in a little bit more into the current magazine, let's make sure we discuss what led you into exile. Um, this is a story I know you've told many times, and, um, and, and some of our listeners uh, are familiar with us already, but it um, continues to be really important for understanding your current situation and also the situation of Shudashur as well as its current mission. So if you don't mind, for those who don't know your story, could you say a few words about why you had to leave Bangladesh? You know, Lisa, actually, I do not feel good to repeat this situation, but um, uh, uh, for your request, I'm uh, telling now, you know, in 2013 to 2016 in Bangladesh, many bloggers, writers, publishers, activists were killed by Islamic extremist group. The time was also the tragedy at the Holy Artisan Cafe in Dhaka where many people, including many foreigners, were killed by extremists. As a progressive and controversial book publisher, I also received many threats. In 2015, October 26, uh, one of the Shuddha Shuddha's writer, Obhijit Roy, everybody knows him, was attending a book launch program 
in our bookstall during a very popular annual month-long Akushe book fair. After the program, when he left the book fair by a side entrance, uh, he was attacked and killed by an extremist group. In the same year, another of our writers, Anunto Vijay, was also hacked and killed. On 31st October 2015, uh, I and two writers were discussing in my office. At this time, some extremists attacked my office and tried to kill me. Two writers tried to stop them. They were also severely injured. Extremists left my office and locked the, all of the gate, gates. But luckily we survived and were hospitalized. When I was in the hospital, I got the invitation from ICON. Due to security concerns, I and my family fled to the neighboring country. Then two and a half months later, we came to Norway. It's, um, it's such a, a difficult narrative to, to try to put yourself into the shoes of you know, what you were going through at that time, what you and your family were going through, others in, um, of your friends and colleagues were uh, facing. It must have, I know it was a very, very um, traumatic and frightful time. Uh, when you came to visit uh, my university, you taught, came and talked to students in my class. And I remember very well one of the statements that you made that day uh, when a student asked a question about whether or not you would want to go back to Bangladesh. Do you remember this? Yes. Uh, you I replied, know. very simply, you just replied, my bags are packed. That really affected them. It helped them to understand that exile, this, you're leaving Bangladesh, leaving Bangladesh, that wasn't a choice. It wasn't something that you planned on or envisioned for your future. Uh, naturally, the place where people grow up is a comfortable place for them to work and also for their family and social life. For me, everything was based in and about Bangladesh. So my activities were based in Bangladesh, my poetry, all of my connections, all the books we wrote and published, those were in Bangladesh. So that was everything we worked on. It was really painful to leave. It still is painful. So yes, if I get an opportunity, I want to go, go back there. So my suitcase is ready. But at the same time, I think of myself as a world citizen. I think my present place is also my place. So Lisa, I have a question to you. You have been doing lots of research work on exile. So what have you learned? Mm. Yeah, um, thanks for that question. And, and I, I, um, I appreciate also just your last statement about how um, your present place, you know, is, 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 is also your home and is, that you feel an identification to where you are now. Um, so when I was interviewing you and many others um, and, pub and when we published that exile issue, one very clear theme that emerged was that exile isn't really a choice, right? Like what we were just saying. So many of the writers in our magazine issue are people who are in exile because their lives are in danger at home, whether it's because of their identity, uh, their LGBTQ um, or other parts of their identity or their political views or their attempts maybe as journalists or poets or, or um, uh, writers to write and speak freely against authoritarian re regimes. So several of our, our writers come from ICORN, which is International Cities of Refuge Network, and PEN. Um, both of these are organizations that specifically aim to protect writers and artists at risk. So that's a network that we've worked quite a lot with. So also what I've learned is how um, precarious and uncertain life in exile continues to be. So yes, sure, people are safe, um, which is great, but that hasn't solved the problems of trauma, of dislocation, of losing everything and having to start all over again in a new country, 
with new social expectations, new language. So simple things like knowing how to, what to say to people, how to behave, how to make contacts or friends. These are really hard things, especially as adults. Um, so it's, you know, it's one thing if you're a younger person um, going, you know, moving into a different country, but as adults, it's a harder, it's a harder thing for sure. So there's a lot of anxiety around um, trying to understand simple things like why there's no invitation for a cup of coffee or why people don't reply to emails. These kinds of things, which normally would just be annoying to most of us, can be really enormous and add to the experience of trauma and worry. And the last thing I'll mention too is how surprised um, the people I've met um, are at being called refugees. And I think a lot about these different categories and what they mean to people, both the people who are labeled those categories and what they mean to outsiders, whether it's you know with people in the community or or, or in the um, state structure. Um, that, so those in exile can't believe that they're categorized and viewed as refugees, that they're in this kind of situation at all, because this wasn't their life plan. For them, like for all of us <laughs> who have home homes and lives, refugees are other people. So it's really disorienting to be called a refugee. For exiled writers and artists that you and I have been talking with, they were, and I think it's so important to remember, they were somebody back home, right? They had jobs, prestige, network, but now not only are they struggling to find their way in society in a new country, but many also face discrimination such as racism or Islamophobia in their daily lives or in the systems that are supposed to support them. So these kinds of challenges are really what motivated us as we worked on that exile issue. And we definitely, definitely plan on having more issues focusing on other aspects of exile. But for that issue, we wanted to focus on the pain, the pain of being an exile, sorry, of being an artist in exile. So we were asking questions in our minds um, because a lot of people were asking these questions too. Why doesn't the exiled person continue writing or doing their artwork or journalism? What's preventing that person, right? That creative person who was really um, very, very active in their previous life. What's pre preventing them from doing their creative work? How can we help motivate them? So we really wanted to hear those stories and their social problems, depression, trauma, we also hoped that readers would listen to these stories, have some empathy, try to understand things a bit more fully, and hopefully take action, even in small ways, um, to help exiled artists and writers um, come out of their difficulties uh, so that they can be productive again, because that is what they want to be, right? They were productive previously, and that is definitely what they want to be now. So um, let's talk about some of the other magazine issues. Right? We've pub published many themed issues on topics like authoritarianism, racism, feminism, LGBTQ, and, and plenty of other, other subjects. What we found is that people are really worried about the direction of the world and the ongoing challenges. challenges. And as an editor, for me, it's really exciting to see that people have things that they want to say about these topics. And many of them are saying interesting and pro provocative things. So each time we publish something, I always learn something new. Um, and that's very exciting. Now, Shoot the Shore has published um, two magazine issues on poetry, one in December of 2019. And now, just now this month, uh, we published an another issue on poetry. Now, I know that publishing poetry is personally very meaningful to you, Tutu. Um, you, as you said earlier, you inaugurated your very, very first uh, issue of the Little Magazine in 1990 with poetry. You write poetry yourself. A book of your own poetry was published by another publisher. You also refer to yourself as a poetry activist. But, 
say something about um, some of your thinking about this particular or these issues that we published. Uh, what was your reason for asking poets to reflect on their motivations and their writing and to respond to uh, predetermined interview questions? Why not just publish their poetry? Yeah, we, we, we published uh, poetry and also related questions. So I consider myself a student of the world and I strongly believe people can gain more ideas when they read. But I know, uh, I know that uh, not everyone likes to read poetry. So it's a very practical, mm -hmm. but if they read then interviews, I hope uh, they will understand how poetry relates to politics, philosophy and everyday life. So I hope uh, they will become curious about also the poetry. So for that, actually, uh, we decided uh, we'll publish poetry with interviews. Um, I love that. Uh, and I know that you, you know, these kinds of um, uh, uh, interviews and um, uh, uh, responses to these questions also can be very inspiring to young writers. And I hope that viewers, even people who don't think that they like poetry, uh, we'll check out the amazing poetry that we published in these issues because many of them are, are very thought provoking. Uh, many of them are original public uh, compositions that have just, you know, this is the first time they've been published. Um, so really please um, check them out even if you don't think you like, po lo like poetry. Um, so Kutul, this month's issue is specifically on political poetry. There's a long history, as you of course know, of Bengali political poetry. Yeah, you're right. Uh, historically, poetry is Bangladesh, is very political. Uh, uh, poets have been uh, vocal about all kinds of uh, human rights. Sometimes these political messages, messages are very direct, and but um, sometimes the uh, messages are indirect, abstract, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So in fact, this is very similar to um, folk songs, um, folk tradition in, in the Bengal, the greater Bengal region. So I'm thinking like, for example, the songs of Lalon Shah, uh, Lalon, Lalon, uh, Lalon Shah. Uh, or Lalon Fakir. Um, in these songs, there are always these, you know, external uh, meanings as well as internal meanings. And so when taken at face value, if you listen to a song, um, it may sound like it's about God or about everyday life, but under the layers, um, there the songs are about other subjects like women's rights or critiques about religious conventions and taboos or about discrimination and the caste system. And this to me is really the beauty of Bengali poetry and songs, right? Is that there are these multiple layers of meaning um, the evocative imagery from everyday life and the intense passion, whether that passion is for a human, a country, the divine, or the divine within all humanity. Right? So it's just a beautiful part of Bengali poetry. But the poetry that you help select uh, in the uh, political poetry issue in that last article, in uh, particularly those were not um, abstract kinds of um, songs. They were, they were very direct and strong. Uh, and that's true also with the very first poem uh, by Qadi Nazrul Islam, right? So say something about why you and Iktishad selected the poems for that last article that, um, that you worked on. Actually, we selected some modern political poetry that are strong and resonate with us personally. The eight poems uh, in that last article, which Iktisha translated so wonderfully, uh, they're very significant. So they are about uh, political events in Bangladesh and the greater Bengal, the language movement, uh, 52's language movement, 69's people movement, uh, 71's uh, independence war, martial law, and the dream for an equal and just society. So these statements are very direct. Only Shukanta Bhattacharya's is not so contemporary. His poetry deals with the British period before 1947. 
So his poems were against colonialism. Lisa, I have another question to you. Can you tell our viewers uh, about Shuddhashur's other activities? Hmm. Yeah, of, of course. So we've talked a lot about the magazine uh, issues. And so um, that's definitely a very important um, part of the platform, the Shoot the Shore platform. But Shoot the Shore has grown in, in many ways. So we have other sections too. We have essays, we have long form podcasts. Um, the image on the screen there is of our most recent podcast, uh, um, which was with Lila um, Byers, who published an article on for the body politics issue, which was the previous um, uh, magazine issue. Uh, we also um, contribute statements um, to express solidarity with an individual or group that is under threat. So for instance, we just posted a statement about Afghanistan, expressing concern and solidarity for the Afghan people. Um, we also uh, um, have a section on book and film reviews that are relevant to the kind of uh, overall message of Sudhisthor. And I'll add that uh, recently, um, the editorial board made a, what I think is a really great decision about our four annual theme-based issues, right? So we, we publish four issues for the magazine each year. And so what we've decided is that one issue is going to focus on creative work like poetry or short stories and um, things of that nature. Um, another issue, so each year, we'll focus on something that's a bit more abstract like what we did with the um, body politics uh, and a future one we're, we're, we'll be doing is, is going to be on public art. Um, and then the other two issues per year will focus on, I guess you could say more tangible political subjects like authoritarianism, blasphemy, and so on. So related to that, then our next issue is going to focus on the climate crisis. And that would be published in November, November 1st. Um, we plan these issues uh, ahead about six or nine months. So please be sure to look at our social media and definitely visit our Shoot the Shore platform regularly because there's all kinds of things that we're doing all the time. We have also an interesting section. It's an interview and we already published some of interesting interview. Yes, that's right. Thank you for, that's absolutely right. We have, have had some great interviews and are looking forward to more of those. Um, now, Tutul, I know that one of your dreams has been to return to publishing books. Say something about that. Yeah. Since October 31st, when I was attacked, 2015, so I have been looking for a way to get back into book publishing. So despite many attempts, I was unable to continue publishing in Bangladesh. Personally, I have had to face extreme economic losses also, but publishing is more than a business for me. It is also a passion. So I believe text is the most powerful weapon. Mm. Yeah, I feel like that's another one of our mottos, right? Is, is the pen or the text um, as a powerful weapon to, to fight discrimination and to um, uh, have a voice in, in all these debates. So I should um, add also that it's no con coincidence that the LGBTQ ebook is your first choice in this um, upcoming, maybe hopefully series. So yeah. it's So why, uh, I mean, I know why, but for our viewers, say something about why this particular issue is, is, is important to you. You're right. Uh, there are many misconceptions regarding LGBTQ, even in developed countries. Uh, the people of this group are subjected to hatred, discrimination, and torture. The situation in South, Asia can, South Asian countries is even worse. Unless the general public as a whole has rational knowledge about this topic, nothing will work. So this was basically 
the purpose of our full magazine issue dedicated to LGBTQ. Uh, in addition to this, Shuddheshwar published a book on homosexuality and love by Abhijit Roy. Uh, because of those books, the author was killed and I was threatened as a publisher. So as an individual and as an organization, we feel a responsibility for these topics and this community. So all of this is a continuation of our sense of responsibility. Right, so I think that's so important, right? Um, Shoot the Shore plans to start the book journey again, right? By publishing a book on the subject, subject about which you were attacked and which caused Shoot the Shore, or at least was one of the contributing um, reasons for Shoot the Shore to have to stop all activities in Bangladesh. That book um, is tentatively called Reimagining Queer Utopias, Voices from South Asia. I think one of the previous slides um, showed um, the call that went out earlier. Uh, we have a really great team of experts working on this now. Uh, it's going to be, I'm, I'm really excited. It's going to be a, a unique and important contribution to understanding the views and hopes of the queer community in South Asia from their varied perspectives, right? Because we have to remember that, that you know, we're, this is not a monolithic group that we're talking about. They're, you know, their experiences and their views and ideas um, are, are, are indeed very varied. Um, so it will be interesting to look at, um, uh, at this book. Uh, and then um, I think, and to, to we have, we're working on a few other books, is that right? No, we are also working on a, a few more books. Initially, the books will be published in um, ebook form. Uh, then we'll try to uh, take initiative to make a print version. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about Shoot the Shore's history, philosophy, magazine issues, and future plans. I'm sure when you started this online journey, Tutul, um, in 2017, you did not know where the journey would go. Yes. Actually, uh, I was worried, I was confused, I was scared. At the same time, I made a promise to myself. So I was ready to face any kind of obstacle, any kind of resistance or non-cooperation. After one year, I convinced you, means Lisa Knight, to write for Shuddha Shur. Uh, by this time, I invited many people uh, I made to contribute an article. In 2018, uh, you, means Lisa Knight, met with me for research work with many long, long questions. Uh, you interviewed me with many different angles, with many cross questions. Uh, you also talked to my family members. Uh, then you understood my thinking, uh, my plan, motto, philosophy about Shuddha Shur. After that, uh, you, Lisa Knight, kindly agreed to become involved with Shuddha Shur. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to admit, um, working with Shuddha Shur was not part of my original plan, not at all. Know, yeah. uh, my research, as you know, because of all the, all the questions that I was asking you uh, and, and the many other uh, exiled Bangladeshis, was really focused on everyday lives of exiled Bangladeshis and sort of their visions for continuing their work and their connections with Bangladesh and their current circumstances. Yeah. So can you tell us uh, how were you motivated and influenced to join with Shuddha Shur? That is such a great question. Uh, so I think some of this goes back to that um, the spirit of the little magazine and the way that you uh, you work um, to told to try to motivate and activate people to think. So, so uh, you asked me to write an article about American politics, uh, and this was in 2018, um, and I was a little bit dumbfounded. I didn't know how I was going to write this article. I didn't know. I wanted to say no. <laughs> This is not my area of expertise, um, but even more than that, it was, it was just, it was also really a frustrating and challenging subject. So it took me a long time to, to write. It was really difficult to write. And I wanted to explain things, you know, from different perspectives, 
but I really struggled also with my audience. Um, and I don't worry about this with a lot of the writings that I have to do um, for my own work. But in this case, right, because it was for Shoot Ashore, it was a international platform. I had to sort of grapple with how to explain US political situation to people who were in Norway, in South Asia, and in America and elsewhere. And that made me think hard, right? And in general, writing just really makes me think hard. And in teaching, I, I know how important writing is. Writing clarifies your ideas or reveals holes in your thinking, inconsistencies in your thinking. But um, so that was, you know, sort of the first step. It's like, wow, okay, this, this is really interesting, um, getting challenged to write about these kinds of topics. But the idea of encouraging people, you know, whether it's young people or experienced people to, to write for this platform, not for a class assignment, which I do all the time. Um, it was exciting, right? I saw how you pushed people to write because that's what I experienced. Uh, and it was great. It, it's like making people eat their vegetables for their good health. And so really, I more people to eat vegetables. So that was great. And I also have to say, I resonated with the ideals of Shudasur. In my early research, which you know about, um, I had worked for several years with the bowels in West Bengal and Bangladesh. So I already adopted a concern for marginalized voices, which bowels seek to support through their songs and other ways. And Shudasur is concerned with marginalized voices also and seeks to work toward a more egalitarian, just, and democratic society by providing a space um, for those voices and to inspire each other and inspire readers. So now, uh, you know, this was, wasn't part of my earlier research. Now, you know, the voices that I'm concerned with, that, that is the concern of Shudashur, includes the voices of, the, of exiles. So that's yeah, so it's been an, a meaningful experience um, for me. I, I have to admit, it's been probably one of the most meaningful um, activities that I've been involved with. So thank you for making me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Really you. Uh, yes. So we want to now uh, <clears throat> hear from you uh, about our viewers, um, our means Shuddhashurs, mm -hmm. and other progress activities. Great. Um, okay. So since uh, January 2017 until now, August uh, 2021, we've published nearly 700 pieces. That means mostly articles, um, but also statements and podcasts and interviews and reviews and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. We have um, had the privilege uh, to in include uh, writers that are some of them who are really widely known, um, academics, um, scholars, activists, poets. Uh, so some names I just bring to mind are like Wendy Doniger, uh, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, Marianne Hele Lucas, Jean Favre Sada, Sajed Kamal, Sindra Bangstad. Alrid Engelston, Rude, uh, Eldrid Lunden, Mubashar, Hassan, Michael D. Jackson, and, and many more. Um, so it's, that's been a very exciting thing for us to be able to feature articles from them. And, and as an aside, what I lost love is, is being able to feature these awesome scholars next to students and, of, and activists and people from different parts of the world. And, it's a great combination. Anyway, Judith has become also very international, right? So our readers are located in 56 countries, which is pretty cool. Our writers come from um, many different countries. So Norway, of course, Denmark, Sweden, UK, Canada, US, uh, France, Germany, Italy, South Africa, Congo, Eritrea, Syria, Bahrain, Iran, Iraq, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, India, Cambodia, Australia, and others, right? So we have writers coming from all over the place. Um, 
Another thing I'll say about where we are is we've heard from many academics and other readers about how unique Shoe the Shore is as a magazine of articles centered on a, on a theme, right? So an issue centered on a theme and written by writers of various ages and perspectives in different countries. So combining academics, acti um, artists, activists, and regular people who are just trying to figure things out, it's a really, really fantastic um, uh, uh, thing that we have been told um, that we're doing. Um, and I often assign, in fact, I often assign, assign um, articles from Shudashor to students, and I know my colleagues do the same thing because they're well written. These articles are well written, and they they address important topics. And they're like these little windows. Like I'm thinking right now about the issue on on exile or the issue on on racism. Um, they're like these little windows into another world, into a different perspective. Um, these little gems of a you know that uh, people can hold on to and, and look at the world through that. Um, Gem for, for a period of time, and that helps people to think. I've had students browse through and analyze a particular theme-based magazine in order to come to their own conclusions about that topic. So, so these, I think, are really um, great indicators of where we are um, and, and think in areas that, which I think we're gonna continue to grow in. Um, we are also really fortunate, fortunate that we have a board of advisors and three superb editors um, that you heard from in the very, very beginning. So our, our editors, Shudartha Iftisam Iftisad, have ideas and insights that are incredibly important for our contemporary moment. They have their fingers on the pulse of our changing complex global world. Uh, so it's really exciting to uh, involve them. We've also had four interns including one, Drew Davis, who proposed our special issue on body politics, and another, Mbali Khubi, who is in South Africa, and who is now a regular columnist for our essay section. So we've been doing a lot, and in many ways, you know, when you step back and listen to all of this, it looks and sounds like a tremendous success story. And I think in many ways it really is. I mean, we have done so much and, you know, Futal, you know, in the very beginning, first big chunk of those few, these few years, we've, everybody's been doing this as a volunteer, you know, on a volunteer basis. So um, we've um, been very successful, but it has, has also, um, and continues to be a struggle. Uh, some of this connects to just the challenges of being in exile. Right, so you, you've, you have had to reestablish yourself and make new connections, but there's also the financial aspect to this, right? Um, so we're incredibly grateful for uh, Frit Urd Foundation and uh, the Norwegian C Cultural Council who have helped um, to support writers and um, support the infrastructure. And that has, has been indispensable really. Um, but of course, we're constantly worried about funding. Uh, it's the insecurity of this kind of kind of work um, that we're doing that I think a lot of colleagues in similar kinds of fields are also doing who, who are focusing on exile writers and artists. So I have to ask Tutul, um, put you on the spot here. Um, most magazines use advertisements or subscriptions to support the production cost of their, of their publishing. Why have you wanted to avoid these options? Uh, actually, right now, we don't have any commercial approach and we don't have any uh, advertising contacts in Norway. And also, uh, we don't want to do any negotiation only for money. So, but if anyone want to support us, uh, we will welcome them. Uh, it's true, we are working very hard to continue our work, to fulfill our vision and mission. Uh, we are capable to doing uh, even more important work. 
And uh, certainly if we had more uh, financial support resources, uh, we could do more work uh, for the community, uh, for inspiring writers and exiles, uh, and the promoting multidimensional critical thinking also. Mm. Yeah, and, and we have, um, we've talked about many future plans, right? And so we've mentioned some of them here already, um, other plans that we have discussed and, um, and hope to do is to organize workshops in communities, organize poetry readings, especially um, poetry, poetry readings. Festival. Hmm? Poetry festival, my great yes. poetry festival. Poetry festival, exactly. Um, especially ones featuring exile poets. Right? Yeah. Um, we also want to uh, build more connections with universities, uh, hoping to create some opportunities to work with academics and students through, through various sessions, uh, maybe, maybe organizing a panel around a topic that's critical today. Um, so there are a lot of things that we are um, interested in doing uh, as we look ahead. Uh, our response so far has been very, very strong and positive, and that certainly motivates us to do better uh, in our work and supports uh, to support freedom of thinking and expression. So yeah, we have many ideas and plans. We're capable of doing more work. Um, as a teacher, academic, writer, I, I feel like if we can get more connections, more support, we can also encourage more exiles and, and more students as well to um, engage with Sudhishur. And I think that would be um, great for, for all people involved. So Tutu, would you like to say something to conclude this um, for our audience? Yes, uh, I want to request to my, uh, our audience, uh, stay with us and please subscribe and support Shuddhashar. So we welcome uh, your any kind of participation. Thank you. Mm, great. So thank you everyone. Um, in our conclusion, we are going to shift over to show a short video of poetry. Um, this comes from the Bergen Literature Festival in 2019. I hope you enjoy it. I'm sure you will. And I hope it also inspires you to read poetry. If, you, if that's not your area, come visit our website, uh, see our current issue, and definitely, definitely, definitely stay in touch and um, subscribe and, uh, and read. Read and write for us. Thank you. Hi everybody, all of the late night passenger of poetry train. <laughs> Take my greetings, love and solidarity. Molin are Dhamsha Prapto Jacketir Pocket with Joel, Dami Kalom Ned Hurevarache, Shamar Shamshar Bohi Mutu, Bodhun Mad Porichoy, Hurir Alufuta, Chom Dukare, Fuleuta Tanta Nek Bohoman Strode. Hore o shonthayer alada rom, alada abeg, alada prakash. Aar, aar o prakash ite jato, jato bodh, bodh jeno kono, maathir petir moto bhekti goto gopon tanel. Sensations with a sparkling expensive pen in the pocket of a soiled tattered jacket a taut flowing current inflated in the dim darkness of emerging dawn known to be stark raving mad excluded from society and the world is wandering about its colors are different in morning and in evening its emotions different its expressions different and and all those all those unexposed sensations those sensations are seeming like a secret personal tunnel in the belly of a fish memory jhuk kore jhap phela shondhay 
চশমার কাজ ভিজে যায় কবিতার খাতার মতো কুয়াশায় When evening downs its shutters, my glasses mist over like a poetry notebook in the fog. Brights. Nibrite nibrite porchi odikar, nodi te bhashi edichi, hawai uri edichi, mukhe plaster laki e chok dut ondho kori diyechi. তবু আমার রক্ত কথা শোনে না লাভ দিয়ে ওঠে সাতে সমুদ্র পার হয়ে যায় নিরবতার মুখ সেটে রেখেছি দেয়ালে আশ্চর্য এই দেয়াল চিত্রের বাইরে আর যেন কোনো ধ্বনি নেই আজ আমরা সকল আর্তনাদের বাইরে দেয়ালগুলো ভরে গেছে লাল রক্ত ছটায় শিল্পীরা ফিরে গেছে স্লোগান লেখার জায়গা নবে today. The walls are filled with streaks of red. The artists have gone back for there is no room for slogans. নিজের কাঁধে নিজে চেপে কোথেকে কোথায় যে যায় ঘোড়া আহা ঘোড়া পুষ্পের তোড়া ধবধবে বকের পাখায় You say it by mistake, I know. I know you say it by mistake. Still, every time you say hello, shallow engine like I leap up, I leap within myself. Riding on my own shoulder, where does it start and where does it go? The horse, oh the horse, a bouquet on the white crane's wings. Yet it can be called love yet again, though it's a debt to airy sounds, all of it. Mark it. Tarkur to me, see. কাস্টমার My pockets loaded with the shed leaves of winter. Yes, back to me. Uh, first, I have to say that we are really sorry for the technical problems, but I want to assure you that the recording will be published on Holgrand's website later today. So 
Uh, I want to thank you, Visa and Tutu, for this wonderful conversation. And I'm sure everyone learned a lot about the Shutu Shore's story and the challenges. Uh, thank you, Shutu Shore, Whole Round, and Safe Muse for hosting this Freedom Talk. Uh, the Freedom Talk series is a concept closely connected to the annual Safe Heavens Conference, and it focuses on the issues regarding threats towards artistic freedom, free press, and intangible heritage. And earlier this year, a new international NGO called SHIFT uh, was established with Safe Muse as fiscal sponsor to secure the Safe Heavens Conference and Freedom Talks initiatives. And the next Freedom Talk will be in collaboration with Amani on Friday, 1st of October. And thank you again for joining us today and please stay safe.